Okay, and I'm so pleased to welcome Kim Flottam this morning. He's the editor of Bee Culture Magazine, a prolific beekeeping author, and a regular here at the Ohio State Bee Lab webinar series. We're happy to have Kim back again, talking about a really important topic, which is honeybee nutrition. So Kim, I'll turn the floor over to you. Good morning, Denise, and everybody uh, tuning in here. Nice to be here. The sun is shining. I think spring is finally here, and I saw my first dandelion yesterday. So it's got to be getting better instead of worse. So uh, I'm just in a really good mood this morning. And I want to talk about honeybee nutrition today. And the reason I, I chose this topic is because all of the things that are going on with bees, all the attention that they're getting, and, and people point at things that are going on that aren't uh, in the best interests of honeybees. And they talk about, they talk about pesticides and they talk about Varroa and viruses, and they talk about nutrition, and and nutrition is one of the things that beekeepers can do something about and should be doing something about. And it's it, in fact, all things considered, it's probably the thing we have the best control over when it comes to dealing with a with a colony of honeybees. So, first, of all, what we're going to do is we're going to look a little bit about what goes into uh, you know, constitutes the diet of bees, what they need, and what they're able to get, and then what beekeepers can do to enhance that or certainly to supplement it and, and make it the diet that they have the best that we can offer. And then what can we do with that information to uh, make keeping bees better for us and better for them, certainly for the bees, and manage them so that they can accomplish what they need to do working with the bees and what we want to get out of a colony of bees relative to a crop or relative to uh, productivity, pollination, whatever it is. So uh, let's start with with honeybee nutrition. Um, here we go. Uh, and here we go. We're back. I lost my screen there for a moment. Um, basically, this is what I'm talking about. Honeybee nutrition, enough good food all of the time for every bee in the bunch. And, and if we are able to meet that requirement, bees are going to be happy and beekeepers are going to be happy and I think everyone's going to be doing just fine. So um, here's, this is from Elbert Jaycox, the extension entomologist from Illinois a bunch of years ago. We used to write for our magazine, he was a good friend, and he had this axiom, if it takes a cell of pollen, a cell of honey, a cell of water to make a bee. And if you are aware of that and keep that in the back of your mind all of the time, you're going to be able to look at your colony and go, I need, I'm going to, we're going to need more food because I've got a lot of young bees coming up here and I know that I'm, I don't have enough pollen, I don't have enough honey, uh, whatever it is. So keep this in mind, a cell of pollen, a cell of honey, and a cell of water to make a bee. So. Well, that's there, right there is a honeybee's meat and potatoes. She's she's diving for nectar, and she's she's covered with pollen. And if if life could get much better for a honeybee, I don't know where it would be. But let's take a look at where she's going. Let's talk about the meat to start with, and that of course is pollen. Uh, that's what bees get from you know the male part of the, fo the flower. Pollen consists of fats, vitamins, minerals, and especially proteins. All of the, and proteins, of course, are amino acids. And, and therein lies the variability of pollen for the most part, is the ratios of the amino acids that, that are in the pollen. But there, of course, there's fats and vitamins and minerals. All of these things are important not only to bees, but to your chickens and your cats and to you. We all have to have these in some proportion in our diet consistently. As I said, proteins are uh, comprised of amino acids. And when you take a look at the uh, amino acids that bees need, you can see the list there and the ratios that they need. Uh, isoleucine is the one that um, is the one that, that, that bees are kind of teeter on. This is the one that they need the most of, or almost the most of, but it tends to be the most critical in their diet. So uh, there are available uh, in the literature uh, lots and lots of lists of amino acids in different kinds of, of pollen. And you can find those lists. You can find the amount of crude protein in pollens. We're going to look at some of those. And then of those crude proteins, you can find the list of amino acids. So when you're looking at these, take a look at 
how much of each of these are on that so that when you your bees are foraging and you know that they're foraging on maple, you know that they're foraging on corn or the alfalfa, you can say, well, okay, they're, the diet that they have now is pretty good and not too worried. But if they're foraging on pine pollen or, or corn pollen, it's not going to be so good. We're going to take a look at this. But one of the one of the measuring sticks certainly is protein in the pollen. And, and you're looking for a minimum of 20 to 25 percent. Anything less than that and the efficiency of collection and harvesting and storing begins to diminish rapidly. You like to see pollen that's got 30 plus percent of crude protein and chickens only need 16 percent. So you can see that bees are, are uh, pretty, uh, pretty high demand for protein in their diet. Um, if you consider crude protein as the measuring stick, and that's what we we're talking about, uh, the higher the amount of crude protein they're, uh, they're able to collect, of course, means that they'll have to collect less of it. So that figure right there, 40 to 70 pounds of pollen per year, if I'm dealing with 30, 35, 40 percent crude protein, I'm in the 40 pound range of uh, how much pollen I'm going to need. And if I'm collecting really low level crude protein pollen, I'm going to need a lot more. So again, it depends on where your bees are and what they're collecting. Uh, for every 10 grams of protein needed, the colony has got to collect 48 grams of 30 percent or 72 grams, and that's just what we were saying. The higher the protein, the less they have to collect. Uh, some of the amino acids, again, when you're looking at those lists, if you can dig them out, um, aren't going to be. The ratios are different. Every plant is different. That nectar is different, and the, and the pollen is different, and that imbalance is, may show up on some of them, and we're going to look at, at some of these in a minute. But you'll see if uh, that um, a steady diet, no uh, a diet that's not has no diversity in it, for instance, uh, pure, pure pollen from strictly almonds or pollen strictly from apples or whatever uh, else crop there, and when you've got a monoculture crop, you're going to have a monoculture pollen, and you're going to have a diet that may uh, have some imbalance and may have some deficiencies in it. What happens to that when that occurs, not enough pollen collected, no matter the crude protein percent, you're going to begin to lose, you're going to have brood produ production is going to begin to decrease. It makes perfect sense. Not enough food, you're, you're not going to be able to feed the kids. Um, and if it gets down below 20%, as I said before, no matter how much you collect, it just, you just can't get it into the kids enough, uh, fast enough that they're able to use it and, and they're going to stop raising kids. So, uh, again, take a look at what your percent power or what percent of protein is. I mentioned fats, cholesterol. <clears throat> My doctor says I have too much, so I take a pill every day. And, and, and maybe some of you do, but you have to have some. And bees have to have some too, just like every other animal. Cholesterol is needed for brood rearing and just to day-to-day -day living. Fats, uh, pollens that are high in fat, and you'll see some of these, um, are really attractive to foragers, and, and this is why. And you're going to find out, for the most part, almost every animal is looking for more fat in their diet. Fat is not a real common attribute in in the wild, and, and if you've got a plant that's producing, a, I, I use the term greasy, a greasy pollen, uh, it's going to be really attractive, and this is why, because they're after the cholesterol in it. Cholesterols have some microbial activity, and, and of course, uh, lots of lipids, fatty acids, sterols, phospholipids, uh, all of these things are, are uh, necessary for just everyday living, just, just to, uh, you know, to body parts and all that. One of the interesting things here, uh, linoleic acid inhibits the growth of American fall brood and European fall brood. It's a lot of years ago, the USDA was really interested in trying to harness that attribute of linoleic acid and getting it into a colony. It's a, it's a component of pollen. How much better could you get in terms of a drug to treat a disease? And I guess they, they stalled out on the uh, delivery pattern or the delivery mechanism. They couldn't get it into the bee so that it was working in terms of uh, being able to um, fight American fall brood, which is too bad because uh, I think maybe we need to revisit that. That would be an excellent thing to have available. There's potassium, phosphorus, magnesium. Uh, in pollen, 
all insects require this, you require this, every animal requires it, and of course, on the other side of the coin, sodium, calcium, and sodium chloride, salt. You need a little, but you don't need a lot. And uh, I, and uh, as I've, as I uh, have aged gracefully, I'll say, have um, become more and more aware of the salt in my diet and, and what I'm eating and how much salt that it has. And it's, of course, because it is detrimental. Bees re recognize this also. Uh, if you want to try something uh, interesting with the pollen that your bees are collecting, and, and, and uh, you've got to have some kind of kind of sophisticated equipment, but take a look at the amount of ash that's in there. Get, get a bunch of po uh, pellets of pollen, weigh them, and then put them in a small jar or a test tube and essentially apply lots and lots of heat until there's nothing left but that gray powder at the bottom and take a look and see how much ash is in there. And you're going to see that some pollens have almost none. Um, and some pollens have a lot more. And one of the pollens that, that uh, is guilty of this is aster pollen in the fall. And, and you'll see that it has a high ash content. And this is one of the reasons that bees don't overwinter so well on aster honey is because there's a lot of ash in, in the honey as well as the pollen. So uh, you can see what happens um, when you get 2 plus percent brood production begins to go down if 8 percent ash is going to stop. So uh, if there's some thought that something's going on in your colony, it may be the source of it may be the source of pollen that you're using. Not common, but uh, they've discovered some of them and of course some of the fall late fall asters are one of them. Pollen certainly is loaded with vitamins. B complex, A, A, vitamin A and vitamin K are essential for gland growth and brood development. Your kids gotta have vitamins, that's why you give them the pills and you gotta have vitamins, that's why you continue taking them. Uh, one of the things that that uh, be aware of is if you're going to be trapping pollen for sale re for sale later or to feed back to your bees down the road, you can you know you certainly need to store it and keep its nutritional value as high as you can over time. And one of the ways to do that, of course, is one of the best ways to do that is to is to freeze it. But even better is if you can get it irradiated first and then freeze it because that irradiation stops the the, the degradation of some of the components in the pollen cold and and it will remain high value if you keep it frozen or quite all I'm not going to say indefinite but for certainly uh, up to a season you know from uh, a, little, a year or a little bit less if you're selling it uh, and you have available uh, irradiation services available that's something you're going to want to investigate but certainly keep it frozen because it begins to degrade really fast when you don't have enough pollen, when, you're, when your bees are looking and there's nothing out there and, and there's nothing stored and they've got a house full of kids, what happens? Well, of course, brood production slows. It will eventually stop. Uh, if there's nothing to feed the family, they're, they're not going to raise any family. Uh, workers without sources of pollen, of course, most of the pollen, most of the pollen in, in the colony is eaten by house bees, turned into brood food and fed to the brood. Kids get most of the protein. Adults aren't, e aren't eating much of the protein. It's the kids on, their, on when the brood as they're developing. But what happens is if there's a shortage of pollen and there, there just isn't enough to feed that brood. As those brood matures and finally emerges as an adult, they're, they're going to be shortchanged. And they're not going to live as long. They're just not, not as healthy. Um, it takes drones longer to reach maturity if they weren't fed enough protein when they were... Uh, when they were uh, developing, they're going to be less fertile. And of course, drones are a luxury in a colony. And if there's a stress on the colony, you know, the retirement program for drones just kind of is very good. And if they're, you know, they're the first ones to go when there's a food shortage, they get elected first and then they're kicked out. And, and to save the protein in their, their lifeless bodies, they may even be consumed. Bees may. Uh, essentially recycle the protein in them. Uh, fewer drones, of course, if you're in the queen business, you're going to have poor mating. And, and uh, the other thing that's going on is, the other thing going on is that uh, if a colony perceives the fact that drones aren't very good, that the kids aren't being fed, one of the, one of the things that can happen is Maybe our queen isn't doing what she should be doing, and they're going to try and replace her. So uh, 
it's a cascading effect when pollen and protein is, if you will, begins to diminish coming into the colony. All sorts of things are triggered, and eventually, of course, the colony is going to starve uh, if it doesn't get enough. We talked about some of the things that um, you know, some of the crops that produce pollen, and and here's some of them uh, that you may run into: canola, 23 percent. Remember. You want 20 to 25 percent, over 30 is best when you're looking at crude protein. Um, the 20 to 23 percent, the amino acids in canola are, are meet all of the minimum requirements. So uh, if you've got nothing but canola pollen, you're going to be doing OK. You want some different variety a little bit later, but storing some buckwheat, 11 percent. Uh, the honey is, um, uh, of course, you know, buckwheat honey, strong and dark, and of course the protein is uh, the, the crude protein isn't all that great. And buckwheat pollen is one of those pollens, of course, that has, is relatively high in ash. So you don't want a ton of buckwheat pollen in your colony. Some is going to be good, but you can see the crude protein is low and the ash content is high. Sunflower, 15%. That's below 20. Lavender, uh, 19%. Uh, isoleucine is one of the ones that it's short in the, in the amino acids, so kind of watch that. Alfalfa, 21%. That, again, is a little bit short on a couple of the amino acids, so watch those. Pine, we mentioned pine. I mentioned pine earlier. 7% crude protein. It isn't worth the energy to collect it. And, and uh, if you see your bees collecting that, it's essentially trash. Pear, really good. Almond, really good. Uh, a couple of amino acids you want to look at there. Pears, of course, bees don't like pear very well because the nectar is um, not all that great, and they will chew something else. But if that's all they've got, the protein that they're bringing home from pears is uh, pretty good. Raspberries and blackberries, 20% crude protein, beats the minimum requirements. Clover. Uh, I'm going to mention this earlier or later again, but one of the things that you can pretty much count on is that plants in the same uh, um, grouping, like legumes, tend to be have similar kinds of both nectar and pollen in terms of quality. So you take a look at clover and beans and peas and locusts, and they're all <coughs> they're all uh, good in, in uh, uh, crude protein. So any of the legumes that you can get your bees near, you can pretty well figure out that they're going to do OK. Blueberries, not so good. Beans, up again, a legume corn. Almost as bad as pine, not worth your time or trouble to bring it in. Uh, but bees collect a lot because that's the only stuff that's out there a lot when corn is blooming. Willows, not bad, especially early in the season. Our willows are pretty much done. The early ones, the metal ones, are coming into bloom right now. Uh, locusts, a legume, and uh, you can see what that's doing in terms of uh, food protein. It's a good pollen. Well, of course, there's meat and potatoes. Now let's talk about the potatoes here. And of course, that's going to be the carbohydrates. And that comes from the nectar. And, and nectar is the carbohydrate source for bees in the colony, primarily sucrose and water, or sugar, sucrose, sugar, and water. Sucrose is table sugar. Same stuff. This is why we're feeding table sugar. There's a lot more in nectar than there is than this sucrose. And when we feed sugar water to bees, we're missing a big chunk of good stuff that's in natural nectar, but it's at least they're getting sugar into them. Once um, bees collect nectar, and it's the sucrose, if you imagine a 12-chain uh, carbon atom, which is sucrose, they start breaking it down into several smaller chain uh, atoms, fructose and glucose. Uh, the more glucose that you have, of course, the faster your honey is going to crystallize. and <coughs> Uh, both fr fructose and glucose are six-chain carbon atoms, and, and those are readily digestible by bees and by you. So when you eat, when you eat a tablespoon of sugar, I'm going to look at that in a second, but when you're eating a tablespoon of sugar, one of the things you've got to be aware of is the fact that um, your body has to break that down. That's why that sugar energy isn't immediately available. There's a process that you have to break that into six chains so it's available. Bees have to do the same thing. Uh, if you imagine that that um, nectar is about 80% water and 20% sugar, and honey is about 80% sugar and 20% water, you can see how the, the reduction has to go through in the dehydration. And, and uh, if you don't, you're going to end up with a fermented solution. 
I said that there's a lot of things in nectar that aren't in regular sugar syrup, and you can see the list of minerals on the bottom. Of course, every nectar is different than the quantity and, and ratios of these, but almost all nectars have uh, calcium and copper, and potassium, and magnesium, manganese, sodium, phosphorus, and zinc, all necessary requirements for uh, regular day-to-day -day living. There's other sugars that are found in nectar. There's proteins, amino acids, enzymes, lipids, organic acids. Nectar is a, ver is a wealth of, of healthy stuff and necessary stuff. And, and so for a minute, um, I'm, for a minute uh, um, don't think that sugar syrup is an automatic replacement um, for nectar because all of these things that are in there, averaging 25, 25 to 40% sugar. Uh, and, and, uh, and that's where I was getting that 80% 80% water and 20% sugar. So even uh, even 20% is a little bit. But keep in mind, there's a ton of stuff in nectar that we don't give bees when we feed them sugar syrup. There, as you can see, a worker needs 11 milligrams of sugar a day. A 50,000 population colony is going to eat about a pound of sugar or a half a gallon of 25% nectar per day just for the adults. It doesn't count for the kids, and the kids are getting some of that. Uh, 350 pounds of sugar a year. That's a lot of honey, and um, that's a lot of that's a lot more sugar than you and I eat. On average, people average about 77 pounds of sugar a year, and and uh, I, I got a whole bunch of people telling me that's probably too much. I should be eating a lot less of that. Uh, you see this, you know it's true. When food gets plentiful, bees get fussy. Uh, they'll take they'll they'll start ignoring lower uh, sugar content nectars in favor of the higher content nectars, and when nectar becomes scarce, it's just the opposite. They'll take anything that they can get. Uh, we mentioned the fact that related plant flammies have similar nectars, uh, and it's just like the legumes and protein uh, of the pollen. Uh, related plant flammies are going to have similar nectars. Uh, once you get a nectar flow going on, all sorts of good things start going on in your colony. A hygienic behavior start, kicks right in. If whatever whatever level of genetic level of that your bees have, it's going to kick in you because they have to have several things start going on when you get a honey flow. One, they have to have a place to put it. Now, you as a beekeeper you need to make sure that they have a place to put it. Get those boxes on before the honey flow. But if the boxes are there, bees are going to start cleaning those boxes out so that when they're bringing the nectar in, there's some good place to put it. Once they have a food source, of course, with nectar, they're going to have brood coming, or they're going to have pollen coming in. So brood production is going to go up, and and that's going to stimulate pollen collection. And at the same time, uh, they're going to need places to put it. So all sorts of things, good things, start happening when you have a nectar flow. And 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 if if you could see the Activity going on. The, the, uh, if you've ever watched a nectar flow start at, at 8.30, 9 o'clock some morning and it wasn't out there yesterday and suddenly the, the colony, it's like, like somebody tapped them and said, okay, wake up, we got things to do, and everybody gets busy full speed. Of course, when you don't have enough nectar, when you've got a, when you've got a, a dearth or, or somebody mowed the alfalfa field or whatever causes the nectar deficiency to begin defensive, the bees start protecting what they've got. Uh, they're going to send more more bees out to collect nectar than than pollen. That hygienic behavior begins to decrease because they don't need any place to put any more. The brood production goes down, and the brood nest size begins to shrink. And of course, if they don't get enough nectar, they're probably not getting enough pollen either. At the same time, and starvation of the colony is going to uh, kick in unless the beekeepers um, being aware of what's going on. Uh, I want to mention water. Uh, Dr. Jaycox mentioned a, a cell of pollen, a cell of nectar, and a cell of water that that uh, is required to uh, raise a bee. And uh, on a hot day, a colony is going to have somewhere between a gallon, a half a gallon, and a gallon of water per day, and they're going to get it somewhere. And, and if you're aware of that, if you're in a city and you're not supplying that water, they will get it somewhere, air conditioner or somewhere they're going to get it, uh, irrigation, uh, you know, lawn sprinkler, bird bath, swimming pool, somewhere. Um, and some of that water, of course, is met with nectar. And if you've got a really strong honey flow on and you've got a lot of nectar coming into the colony, some of, some of that, a lot of that's going to 
reduce that need for uh, water, just as water, and it will be taken up by the liquid that's in the nectar. But be aware of the fact that, uh, you know, up to a gallon a day, a colony on a hot day, if you've got 10 colonies sitting in the backyard, 10 gallons of water, where are they going to get it? Um, just a couple of things about, uh, you can take a look at the numbers there. Uh, um, and water is in the news every day right now because of what's going on out west. And, and people are beginning to think about water. In this country, we haven't had really a lot of issues with water uh, until the last couple of years. But in, in, the, in the rest of the world, there's a lot of water is a, an issue all of the time. And if it's an issue for people, it's going to be an issue for bees. And, and if, if, uh, if I had bees and I was sitting in the middle of the valley, Central Valley in California, I'd be making sure I got water somewhere for them because uh, they're going to need a lot and, and uh, the people are also going to need a lot. Something to, uh, something to um, uh, think about is how much, uh, something I find interesting is how much water does it take to produce a pound of honey? And it's, there's, a, there's a, I guess you call it a factoid, uh, something called virtual water. And that's how much water it takes to produce all of the plants that the bees visit to uh, collect the nectar to bring it back and bring it back to the colony and turn it into a pound of honey. And, and uh, if, you, if you're interested in virtual water on every, any food crop almost imaginable, National Geographic webpage has, has done the legwork on this. This is, this is from the food pyramid that I dug up quite a while ago. But National Geographic has taken another step. And I urge you, if you're interested in how much water it takes, but, but it takes about 140 gallons of water to produce a pound of honey. So every time you fill up one of those jars, you're putting out one pound of honey, which is about 80% uh, about sugar. So that's 20% of that's water. Uh, 140 gallons of water to get that 20 that 20 uh, percent of that pound of a pound uh, jar full of water. So there's a lot of water that goes into uh, uh, making that pound of honey. Uh, this is one of the other things that is going on with bees. We are consistently run into this problem, and and um, there's a lot of Attention being given to pesticides and bees, and, and bees encounter pesticides in the real world. They, uh, no matter where you are, you're going to run into some kind of uh, toxin out there. It may be a natural plant toxin, but more likely it's going to be an agricultural toxin. And um, be aware of the fact that downwind, 10 miles, uh, talking to a uh, honey, uh, a tree grower. This past weekend, 10 miles away, a DDT or a, a herbicide spray was out there and damaged his trees 10 miles. The drift was that far. So it's out there, and your bees are going to run into it. And one of the things you have to certainly keep in mind is that they bring it home, and most pesticides, whether herbicide, fungicide, or insecticide, um, are lipophilic, and that means that they just are sucked up by the wax. And, and it's becoming more and more apparent that the stuff in our wax needs to be recycled. And, and it used to be get rid of your wax when it was so dark you couldn't see through it, and then it was get rid of your wax every three or four years, and now it's even less. So um, if your wax starts to turn brown and you, you're in a, anywhere near an agriculture area, think of recycling your wax more often than not, maybe every couple of years instead of... Instead of uh, every three or five. And I'll tell you, if you're in a heavy agriculture area right now, the recommendation is every year. And I know that just is insane, but um, would you raise your kids in that toxic soup that you are bringing your bees up in? And that's something to consider. Uh, we talked about monocultures. They're efficient for raising food. But when you put your bees in the middle of it, that's all they've got. And if you, if you can imagine... Um, going to McDonald's and having a Big Mac, three meals a day every day for, let's say, a month, the length of the crop, three weeks to a month. Well, the first couple of days, that's okay, but after that, it gets really bad, and by the end of the month, you may not even be alive because of the fact that the, the nutritional value of a Big Mac is going to be really high in some things and probably missing some other things. And, and 
besides the fact that eating that many Big Macs would probably drive most of us crazy, uh, the nutritional value is going to cause us some uh, health issues, certainly. So when you've got your bees in a situation like that, for a short period of time and then moving them to another one, for a short period of time this is going to be okay, but um, monoculture after monoculture after monoculture is not going to do as good. One of the things that's led also to monocultures is the fact uh, is our, oh, our country has developed and we started as primarily rural and forested and now we're where you can follow the arrows there, and we're now very urban. And if you take a look at the black line on that map in the center, uh, that's a 50-mile uh, uh, line is 50 miles wide, or it's supposed to be 50 miles wide. And you can see it's on every coast. 53% of the U.S. population lives on that black line, which means that 47% of the rest of us live in the middle. And, and agriculture has taken a big part of that, but also has cement and concrete and asphalt and uh, other things that don't grow plants. Uh, a friend of mine has said that concrete is the last crop. He's exactly right. So so we, we have tended towards monocultures, and it's worked out quite well for us. At the same time, uh, what we grow in the middle has to be shipped uh, to all of the people on that black line. And, and one of the things that we're looking at hard right now is is uh, fuel production, biofuels, and is this as good as, as people think it is? I, I don't have an opinion, but I can look at the results. And, and biofuels don't produce a lot of good food for bees, and um, uh, you can see the, the production there going on. Um, uh, if, I was, if I was living in the heart of the Midwest, anywhere near one of these places, I'm seriously wondering if I would be wanting to be keeping bees there because it's just going to, it's getting harder and harder to be there. All right, that's the nutrition part of this. Now nutrition management. And, and here's where I want to, I want to take this information that you've got and, and how can you use it to, to help your bees, to make your bees stronger and healthier and live longer and all of those good things. And to make you, uh, to have your bees do as well as they can for you. And if you're in this business, to, if bees are putting food on your table, putting kids through college, whatever it is, then managing them as efficiently as possible and as profitably as possible is definitely to your advantage as long as they are as healthy as possible. So uh, getting those two systems to work together uh, is not impossible, but it's something you're going to have to think about. So. Let's take a look at nutrition management, and, and are you feeding your bees? Right now, are you feeding your bees? And if you are, why? And how? And, and when? And let's, let's take a look at that. Uh, a lot of reasons people feed bees. Spring buildup, that's today. Uh, although with the nanoline starting, that's going to be reduced. So I'm trying to get sugar and protein into my, co my spring colonies. Uh, in that next couple of weeks, a lot of packages are going to be going into colonies. And, and if you're just starting out, they're going to be going on foundation. And every bit of nectar that you can get into them, every bit of sugar you can get into them, they're going to be turning into wax to build up uh, cells to get brewed in and store pollen and nectar. So you can't get enough sugar into a package. You just simply can't. So... Um, and protein for the kids because you need you need as many kids as you can get as fast as you can get them as healthy as you can get them. So if you're feeding packages, uh, you lots of sugar and lots of protein. Queen production. If you are if you are a queen producer, then of course you want uh, two things. You want your queen to be able to be fed as well as possible, which means you have to have really good a really good diet for the house. But the nurse bees that are that are feeding the queens and and the drones that are going to be mating with them. So you're going to be wanting to get a lot of high quality protein and as much sugar as you can into them. So all of those those both sets of those bees develop as well as you can to encourage pollen collection. If you're a pollinator and 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 you want your bees out visiting flowers and collecting pollen, thus thus transferring pollen, then the more uh, pollen that you, or the more sugar that you feed them, the less sugar, or the less nectar they're going to have to collect, and they're going to be, their foragers are going to be out doing pollen instead of nectar, so you're going to uh, enhance that behavior. Uh, uh, nectar dearth, in my part of Ohio, we have, uh, 
very predictable ne nectar dearth starting right about the first week of July, lasts about a week or 10 days, maybe as much as two weeks. Sometimes it lasts until frost. But we have a nectar dearth starting in the middle of the summer. If you're down south, your, your honey season is about over so, you know, sometime in July and nothing's going on. So uh, being aware of how much food is coming in and when it's coming in uh, is going to make you a better uh, beekeeper and it's going to help your bees stay healthier. Uh, winter stores, if I'm light on uh, how much honey and how much protein I've got going into winter, I'm going to try and get food into there. And what about emergency feeding in the winter? We're going to look at all of these to stimulate a buildup. Uh, and that's what's going on right now. Is I want I want my bees, I want my bees to start raising lots of young so that I have a big population for that first honey flow, so I can make a crop of locusts here in Ohio. That's a good crop for me. But I'm I'm um, so normally it's been kind of a you know if it's a cool spring they're going to be slower. If it's been a warm wet spring it's going to they're going to be faster. Nature's going to kind of dictate what they can and can't do. But I, I, can, I can enhance what nature's doing and get both protein and carbohydrates into that colony. But I want you to think about something for a moment. Um, when my bees are going out today, and today they're going to be able to go out because the sun is shining, and they're going to find those three dandelions that are in my yard I saw last night. Uh, they're, going to have, they're going to bring that back in and um, uh, store it, and they're, you know, they're, going to, they're going to forage all day, and then, and then come... You know, sundown tonight, there's nothing coming in and there's nobody foraging. Yet when we go out to feed for spring buildup, what we do is we put a gallon, two gallons, whatever it is, of feed on, and we leave it there until it's gone. So what, we, what we're doing is we're taking any sense of urgency out of the situation in terms of food collection. If you think of, if you think of food collection in a colony this time of year, it's really heavy during, you know, it starts at 8 o'clock in the morning, goes to 4 in the afternoon, and it's done. You know, they're curing it the rest of the night, but there's no more food up there. So if you want to think of if you want to think of food collection in the spring, don't think of it as one big feed. Think of it as as a lot of food every day, but not at night. And 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 make sure that they're aware of the fact that this food is going away. You know, about four in the afternoon. I know you might think this is nuts, but I've tried it, and I urge you to try it. Take a colony that you're trying to build up and put a whole bunch of nectar on it in the morning and take it off in the afternoon. I will bet you that you will see that that colony will take more sugar, sugar, not nectar, sugar, than the colony right next to it that you put a feeder on that's got it on 24-7. And, and just see if I'm not right, because this is what bees are programmed to do. They're programmed to think like there's a rush during the day and at night I got another job. I got to cure all of this stuff. And there's a rush during the day and at night I got to cure all of this stuff. See if that doesn't work for you. I know it's crazy. You got to go out there in the morning. You got to go out there at night. But try it and see if it works. And and uh, I think I think you'll see that that you're you're working with your bees when you're doing this. You're not you're not you're not. It's not artificial feeding. It's you're working with your bees. This is how they're programmed to think. So one of the things about open feeding, if you've ever tried that, of course it's an easy way to feed. Uh, strong colonies get more feed than weak colonies, and your neighbor's bees gets get. It may get more than your bees. Uh, it is a way to feed. I don't recommend it, but it may be the most uh, efficient way for you to get as much sugar as you can into colonies in a hurry. And know that you're going to have some issues going in, but um, you can feed. It's a good way to spread disease. Uh, and as I said, strong colonies are going to get more than weak colonies, but some beekeepers still do this. Stimulations for packages or nukes or splits. Again, uh, like we said, bees need as much sugar as they can. You're putting a package in. Even if you're putting them on drawn comb, that package is going to need as much sugar as, as you can get because, because they're going to need to be storing it. Uh, they don't know that there's, if there's going to be a dearth down the road. And, and if, if there is, then they've got some stored. But they're also, the, 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 less, the less sugar they have to collect because you're providing uh, uh, nectar or you're providing sugar syrup, the more pollen they can collect, the more pollen they can collect, the more young they can raise. So uh, the urgency to get as big a population as you can, especially if, you're catch, if you catch a swarm. And if you catch a swarm uh, spring, get as much sugar as you can, or honey if you've got it. Always honey. You saw the difference between honey and sugar syrup in terms of the nutrients. But, but get the carbohydrates in there. 
uh, for that for that swarm. And the same with protein. I'm I'm a firm advocate of the fact that I would I would put put nectar or put sugar syrup and a protein patty on a swarm or a, pa a package. Anything that is uh, struggling to, to get started or to keep going. And the reason for that is because I don't want any stress on that colony. I would rather waste it, put it on and not and have them ignore it completely because there's so much out there. And then I'm going to put it on again when it goes bad and I'm going to put it on again when it goes bad because I remember that July dearth that we have here in Ohio. If I quit feeding at the end of June because they haven't taken anything because there's been a heck of a honey flow and boom, I hit that dearth. They are going full speed and suddenly there's nothing coming in. And if they are building comb and they are raising lots of young and you've got a house full of kids to feed uh, and suddenly there's nothing coming in, uh, if you've got reserves, you're lucky. If you don't, stress on your colony. So to me, um, um, enough food for every bee is good insurance. And, and, and to me, it's a good investment. So I'm going to feed, uh, and, and if it gets in the way of my honey crop, I'm going to have bees down the road that are healthy. I'd much rather have bees than honey. I could get honey later if I got bees. I can't get bees if I don't if I don't have bees to begin with. So, to me, uh, having enough food is is just good insurance. If you're making queens, of course, when do colonies raise raise queen? Swarm season, and and that's what's coming in in swarm season is is. Is, again, we'll look at what is coming into the colony. It isn't two to one sugar syrup. It isn't even one to one sugar syrup. It's a quarter to one sugar syrup. It's really it's it's a stimulant. It's not it's not food. They may need some food. Hopefully, you've taken care of that ahead of time and you've gotten some honey in there, so they've got some. But uh, a, a light nectar flow is a stimulant, and that's what you're looking for. You want that colony to be thinking there's a lot of food out there. There's a lot of food out there. We just have to go get it. If you're feeding protein, and you should be feeding protein if you're raising queens, and if they don't take it, they didn't need it. But of course, if you're uh, if you got protein patties on small hive beetle in the summer, uh, anywhere uh, could be an issue. So keep your eye on that one. And if you have to, if you have to take the protein off for a little while, you can take it off. But uh, let's take a look here. Uh, I mentioned this before: is is um, if you're a pollinator. And you want your bees out there visiting flowers and, and collecting pollen, thus transferring pollen. The more the more nectar you give them, the less nectar foragers are going to have to have, and the more pollen foragers are going to have out there. You're going to be happy because you got lots of protein. Your farmer is going to be happy because your bees did a good job. So keep that in mind if you're a pollinator. Uh, Pre-summer dearth. Okay, um, uh, this is one of the things that I was talking about earlier, is, is if I have a dearth in the summer, uh, one of the things that it can go wrong is that, is that suddenly I got a, a, a colony full of kids, a colony full of adults, and nothing coming in, and not a lot, not a lot stored because I've been building rather than saving. And, and now I want to get thick syrup in. I'm just pushing sugar. That's all I want. I, I, I'm just pushing sugar. Your colony is going to be real defensive if there's a dearth on. So you know, get in there and get out because they're going to let you know that this is not the place to be. No matter you know. So it's both protein and carbohydrates you want to get in that colony. Maybe short duration, maybe a long duration. You don't know. But but if your colony is going through a stress, they're going to start shutting down. Uh, and don't let robbing start. Certainly avoid robbing. And you know what that's going to do. You know, if you got a colony open too long, and and that brings up the question: is you can see the guy in the middle there. He's got a he's got an issue, and and he shouldn't be probably shouldn't be standing there. How does he shut that down? And if you get a robbing situation going on in your bee yard, how do you shut it down? Know how to stop a robbing. A way. There's other there's other ways, but a way the way I control it when I have to. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have to very often. But what I what I uh, do is I shut up everybody. Uh, everybody gets closed up, and and every colony get, has has a wire screen entrance, and, and nobody can get out, and nobody can get in. And all of the bees from strong colonies that are robbing weak colonies will go home, and they can't get in, so they're going to sit on the front door, and and pretty soon it'll calm down. But the best that, of course, is to avoid it, uh, a robbing situation starting in the, in the first place. Uh, if you're going into if you're going into winter and you don't have enough honey, you're 
you suspect you're not going to have enough honey stored then, and there's nothing coming in. You know, after after much after uh, goldenrod, not much is coming in. So you want to get you want to get uh, as much sugar in your colony. That's when you use that's when you use really thick sugar. And and this is just terms of efficiency. How much how much sugar can I get into a drop of syrup that the bees have to go up above, collect, and take down below and store? And and uh, uh, that's one of the things that that um, I don't want to say goes without saying because it needs to be said is 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 it's you just want a pipeline of sugar uh, into into the cells below. I see one of the uh, I see one of the uh, uh, comments down below here. Somebody is mentioning uh, honey be healthy, and and uh, uh, that really needs to come into this discussion because it is it it and the other feeding stimulants that are out there. And I've tried a lot of I think I've tried them all, and I think they all work about the same, or they all work anyway. They all help. They enhance the situation. They make sugar syrup attractive. And one of the things that 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 we need to be aware of is nozema. And the new nozema is, is it, it is um, paramount in the summer more than the spring or winter, and and you're going to see big infestations coming up, uh, you know, like uh, June to August, and that's when it's the so what happens with what does a sick bee do? A sick bee like you and I, when we get sick, we go off feed. So if you've got if you suspect that you've got bees that and nozema is a is an issue certainly take a sample and send it to Beltsville and let them let them um, take a look and let you know uh, but in the meantime get some food into those sick bees a sick a sick bee is going to go off feed and, and a, a bee that's not eating is not going to be uh, any good to the colony and and these stimulants, these you know honey be healthy and the rest of them work uh, at least they help. So uh, they're not free, but if you can get food into a sick bee, you're going to be better off. Uh, one of the things on when you're uh, on a fall, when you're doing fall feeding to get sugar into a colony for overwintering, is uh, you don't want to have a buildup. And how do you stimulate a buildup? Well, that's that really thin stuff, that half to a half a part of sugar to one part of water or a quarter part of sugar. You don't want to be doing that. You want it to be thick, 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 thick. And, and avoid that buildup. Um, just quickly, uh, winter kills, and, and they were pretty pretty good in a lot of parts of the country this year. I'll be interested to see what the what the final outcome is. I know what they were in our part of Ohio, and, and some beekeepers did really well, and some bee, beekeepers did not so well. And this was one of the reasons. It was too cold, too long, or at least that's what people say. Let's take a look at this. Um, why did these bees die? And, and, and it could have been starvation, not enough food. Uh, starvation, food in the wrong place. Was it below the cluster when they went into winter? It was ventilation a problem with some of the pests and diseases. The Varroa virus complex is certainly uh, always on the list of things that cause the colony not to make it through the winter. Uh, the viruses that Varroa transmit cause bees to live shorter lives, and with shorter lives they don't make it. Um, uh, instead of living until March, they only live until the end of December, and pretty soon you run out of bees. One of the things is not enough bees, and, and that's kind of what the beekeepers should be looking at uh, really early in the season. I'm thinking July here is, is how is this queen doing? Are we evaluating the queen, and, and are we, uh, is there enough big enough population in this colony? Uh, you've, seen, you've seen colonies, and we're going to see a picture here of of not enough honey and not enough bees and some of the symptoms. Uh, too cold for too long, no matter how many bees or how much food. And, and that is not, not I'm not going to say rarely, but that is a cause sometimes, is that, is that bees get um, trapped away from food and they can't break cluster no matter how many bees they have to get to, get to food. Uh, at, but there's a lot of things beekeepers should be doing to avoid that. Um, if you're trying to get protein into a colony, here's something you can see on the on the left top side. There you can see uh, you've heard of fat bees and skinny bees, and you've heard of fat bodies. And and if you take a look at that that picture on the top left there, on the right side of that picture is a fat bee. 
and on the left side is a skinny bee. And that fat bee has, has taken protein, uh, ample amount of protein, and converted it to uh, a form that she's able to store most of the vitagelin in, but, but it's a, a form that she can store. She will use that over winter, and she'll use it next spring to feed the developing larva. And that's what you want. You want fat bees going into winter. And, and if you're feeding protein, of course, start with pollen. If you're, tra if you're not trapping pollen this summer, I think you might want to think about trying some of it this year and having some going into winter so that you can feed pollen, uh, collect the, p the pellets that are knocked off in the pollen trap, and, and you simply pack them into a frame. You dump them onto a frame and, and uh, cap a frame on a hard surface so that the pollen kind of goes in and the bees will treat it just like bee collected pollen. If you don't have bee collected pollen, then you've got the pollen patties and you've got dry pollen. Uh, sub, these are substitutes, of course. Um, and, and, and bees treat these things differently. And the, 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 the pollen patties, they will eat and they will convert into fat bodies. And they will, they will use that themselves. They don't store the paddy pollen. But the dry pollen that they collect, that you're feeding them either in the colony or maybe outside, is, is that they're collecting and bringing back, they will store. And they will use that like stored pollen come winter and spring to feed. They use it for the same thing, but, but, but um, you've got, you, want, you want fat bees because they're going to be healthier and able to you know, uh, do well and they'll live longer. And you want stored pollen, you want stored protein so that the bees coming up in the spring, the new one, have a, a, pollen, a protein source to, because their, their first job is being a house bee. They want a protein source to uh, be able to go and collect. There's that fat body. And, and this is what you want. This is what you And you can do this at home, believe it or not. It's hard on the bee. But do uh, next fall, take five or ten bees, throw them in the freezer, and... and uh, when they're, when they're dead, take them out and, and uh, with a real sharp dissecting scissors, cut away the bottom of their abdomen and very carefully pe peel it back. And you will see it will be either look like the top slide, which is uh, rich in protein, or it will look like the bottom slide. And then you'll know, do I have fat bees or do I have skinny bees? And if I don't have fat bees, I'm, I've got a problem. I need, I need to look at this. We talked about not enough food and not enough bees. And not enough food is you just flat run out. But not enough bees is not having enough bees to, to uh, uh, form a, a bridge to get to that honey and, and, and to make a cluster big enough to get to that honey. And, and both of those problems are beekeeper caused and should be um, taken care of way before the bees get to that problem. If you're feeding carbohydrates, of course, honey is the best one to feed if you can. Uh, if you're not, I like fondant only because it's easy for me to feed and it's, the labor involved is almost zero but you know dry sugar on the inner cover works uh, candy boards work and one of the things that we look at here is how much does a colony weigh going into winter and uh, bottom board uh, high stand two deeps uh, inner cover and cover bees brood and food should be in the, my part of the country between 150 and 175 and I push to 180. I like that 170 to 180. Then you know you've probably got enough you've got enough food in there. About 100 pounds of honey you're going to have in there. And 100 pounds is what I'm what I'm suggesting that you look at when you're north as far north as we are. Further south, uh, not so much, but it doesn't go bad. Wouldn't you rather have it and not need it than need it and have to clean up a dead colony next spring? So emergency feeding, candy boards you can do. Uh, fondant works well right over the uh, on top of the top bars because the moisture from the and the warmth of the colony will keep it soft. Same thing with a candy board, and you can do the crystal or, or the regular table sugar. Here we have a honeybee nutrition: enough good food all of the time for all of the.